Um, so maybe I'll start by um, having at least one of you give us an overview of what the Universal Privacy Alliance is um, so that we can have that framing uh, for the remaining part of this panel. Um, you want to do that, Jaya? Yeah, I'm more than happy to do that. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, so I am uh, Jaya Clarabrecki, and I am here on behalf of NIM. Um, and very happy to be speaking about the Universal Privacy Alliance, which NIM was one of the founding companies involved in. Um, so just to in maybe introduce NIM very quickly and why we're into you know, creating this alliance in the first place. Um, and sorry, I'm a little bit out of breath. I've literally just run from the airport, so I'm just <laughs> still catching my breath. Uh, so NIM is a decentralized mixnet um, that is uh, run and operated on the Nix blockchain. Um, so it's a decentralized incentivized mixnet that provides privacy at the network layer by uh, mixing and adding uh, time obfuscation to packets as they are routed through the network. Um, and uh, we were involved in some you know, early panels uh, probably about nearly a year ago now um, with a few other privacy companies in the Web3 space. Um, and we started to, to discuss about you know, the need for really establishing privacy once again as one of the core principles of Web3. Um, it's kind of, it's one of those principles that have been around since the very beginning, in fact, since before, you know, the early days of, of Web3, it was something that the cypherpunks gave us warnings of in, you know, the 80s and 90s, saying, you know, the, the internet is likely to become a, a large vehicle for mass surveillance, and this is something to, to pay attention to. And in many ways, um, when Web3, you know, started off, or crypto started off, it was really, you know, privacy was one of the core principles, and I think, you know, today it's, it remains one of the kind of main interventions, let's say, at a technical level that can really transform and unlock a lot of uh, uh, general transformation in the way that the internet operates. So um, the UPA was founded as a way to uh, reestablish privacy as one of the core principles, um, as a way to start coordinating around uh, legal research and, and a legal fund. Um, you know, the kind of the, the instigator after we had these vague, you know, conversations about like, yes, this would be a good idea, maybe we should have a privacy summit and so on and so forth. Um, you know, then the tornado cash happened and it was, it was a bit of a wake-up call for everybody, right? It was like, okay, actually, as the builders of privacy technologies, we really need to start looking at, uh, you know, sharing some resources and doing some, some serious analysis about the regulatory landscape and, you know, how things might develop down the line. Um, so that's the kind of backdrop. I mean, I can go into a lot more detail, but um, I think, uh, yeah, I might leave it there. I think there's... There's plenty of other things that I would like to discuss as part of this panel. Um, I think, uh, you know, one of the core aims of the UPA, apart from, you know, having a, a privacy summit and, you know, this legal fund, is also to start developing new narratives around privacy, right? Um, so when we're, you know, right now we're faced with, uh, I think, a lot of suspicion, especially when it comes to privacy and payments and financial privacy. And you see that suspicion across the board, right? It doesn't matter what political background, you know, the left is worried about, you know, tax evasion and terrorism, and the right is worried about, you know, control and insecurity, and you've got, um, you know, everything in between, and people, there's a kind of general suspicion around the, the, the question of privacy in relation to payments and, and uh, finance, um, and very little awareness of, you know, what, uh, what's really at stake here. So I think, like, shifting the narrative and making people really realize that this is a historically unprecedented moment in the sense that never before have so, many, so much of our lives and that you know, from, from economic uh, activities through to democratic processes, through to intimate relationships, uh, you know, everything, so much of our lives are actually mediated through digital communications. So as the builders of those you know, digital communications technologies, there is a, a, an entirely, you know, there's a, a serious burden of responsibility um, on us as, build, as builders, but also a serious pressure, right? Um, and a serious pressure to, you know, provide things like backdoors and, and all this kind of other thing. So, you know, it's, I think there's a lot at stake right now, but it's also a moment where privacy, you know, privacy technologies can really uh, be a kind of direct intervention, a kind of blockade on the surveillance-based uh, business model that we see operating um, uh, the kind of technical space at the moment. So, um, but yeah, I'll stop my, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll hand over the microphone and, and open up the conversation more. Absolutely, maybe, maybe Jennifer, you can talk also about uh, any other narratives that you're finding around privacy that are important or effective um, 
Yeah, for sure. So I feel like Jaya makes all of these great points. Um, I've worked on a number of privacy projects, and what I realized is that this privacy narrative is always very anti-something. And a lot of people who work in this industry are trying to forward their own objectives. And by creating, saying, like, privacy is a human right, um, we need to change the way that privacy is viewed. Um, we need to change the way that privacy is perceived in the media. And I think a lot of people in this room, especially people in Web3, totally get it. But with small teams and limited budgets, like we can only do so much. And by coming together and forming the alliance, it allows us to take that narrative guided by the founding principles, which are all agreed upon, and allows us to ha start having that conversation with a wider audience in a more generalized way where we're elevating it from the bottom up as well as the top down. Awesome. Um, I can just kind of tack on, I mean, everything um, that we've said here so far, I think is, is true, uh, and for all of us. Um, Will, in the preparation for this panel, I think it was you that said something about privacy being the, I'm gonna try if I can see if I can get it right, it's like the basis of free and flourishing digital societies, is that what you said? I'm not sure I said that, but I believe it. It's, it's great, <laughs> it's great. Um, and we talk about privacy as a human right, and I would take it even a step further that privacy is essential to being human, right? I mean, it's, it provides security, it protects our ability to be creative, it protects our ability to learn, it gives us the ability to consent. Um, we often think about privacy being shutting out everyone and shutting out everything, uh, but what it actually gives us is the right to grant access, right? To decide what and with whom we will share. And it's important, privacy is, um, a, 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 is a mechanism for unity and equality and dignity. Um, we believe, you know, our, our, our mission at Electric Coin Company, by the way, just background, Electric Coin Company um, built and launched Zcash in 2016, it's a fork of Bitcoin, private transactions and memos. Um, but this idea of our mission at Electric Point Company is economic freedom for everyone, empowering economic freedom, and human dignity is a big part of that. We believe that people should be valued for just being human, right? Not because of where they live or how much money they have or their usefulness to someone else's ambition. Um, so yes, the stakes couldn't be higher Without privacy, we lose self-sovereignty, um, we lose autonomy, the powerful become more powerful, and that puts the rest of us in a position where we become instruments to their will and to their ambitions, those of corporate um, corporations and governments. Maybe one sort of extension on this is as, as Electric Coin Company, um, you've had to think a bunch about uh, financial regulation and, and sort of a, a, a fairly uh, intensive attempt to remove privacy uh, on the financial uh, side of things. Yeah. Um, what strategies or narratives do you find most effective there? Well, yeah, strategies and narratives, two different things kind of, or at least the way I separate them in my mind. With regard to strategies, we work, we have, a, we have a team that works with regulators and policymakers in the US and globally. Um, we are in meetings on the Hill often in Washington, DC. Uh, it's our belief that, you know, it's very important for us to be able to educate those people who are making the rules around which we live. And it's really that, it's just educating. We like to talk a lot about, you know, crypto Twitter likes to yell a lot about people like Elizabeth Warren, right, who has been down on crypto um, and has said things like, we just need to ban it and things like that. But I think that with regard to elected officials and regulators and policymakers, um, we have to A, be empathetic to their mandate, right? And for specifically for like somebody like Elizabeth Warren, whose whole thing is consumer protection. I think that we have a lot in common actually with her and with people who are like on the very opposite side of the political spectrum. 
they are, we, have, we are building tools for inclusivity and for access. Elizabeth Warren loves that. We are building tools to fight corrupt governments. Elizabeth Warren, is, that's her thing, right? We are building tools to provide freedom where freedom has not existed at the levels that we want it to. People like Ted Cruz love that, self-sovereignty. So with regard to regulation and policy, I think we have a lot in common. Our job there is to educate. With regard to narratives, um, we are, it's, I think we touched on this earlier. I think Jai touched on this earlier. We tend to, when we think about privacy, we always go to the big stories, like somebody got arrested, right? Or um, somebody's rights are being infringed, or people are being persecuted. We have this crutch story that we tell in our worlds about Hong Kong and the protesters a couple years ago who went to the metro station and used cash to buy their metro tickets because they didn't want to be identified by their metro cards, that they were there at the protests. Um, we talk about, you know, like enabling people to escape the watchful eye of a tyrannical government. And these are all important. We're building for this. But we're also building for Tom, a 32-year-old father of two in Wisconsin, um, who wants to be able to build a business plan without the peering eyes of his competitors, who wants to keep his medical records out of the public eye, who wants to keep his potential new employer from understanding how much money he has in his wallet or how much his mortgage costs. We talk about privacy as normal. It's for big things, but it's also for little things. It's for everyday stuff. I see a hand from Jaya. Do you want to do that? <laughs> um, no, I'm just gonna, I thought I might like say what the the principles are of the UPA because um, in fact like it, you actually named several of them, which is fantastic. <laughs> just like in your you know as as you were speaking. Um, so the UPA is, uh, you know, the, the alliance has a lot of different companies, right? And we're trying to build an alliance with, you know, a core set of basic principles that are really quite simple, but where, you know, there is common agreement on those. And then when it comes to kind of further strategies, you know, to what extent you want to engage with regulators or not, in which jurisdictions and so on and so forth, we leave that quite open because, you know, the world is not just the United States, right? So it's also, you know, companies exist all over and we have, you know, slightly di different battles with different types of states, let's say, you know, um, or different types of, of uh, private sector um, arrangements as well. So um, the core principles uh, of the UPA are three very simple principles. The first is privacy is a fu fundamental human right. Um, the second is uh, privacy should be by default. Um, and so here it's really kind of emphasizing that if privacy is a fundamental human right, then actually like its incorporation by default into the communications technologies that have become so core to the functionings of our societies becomes a necessary must, right? And then the third is privacy is normal, meaning you know these technologies and their use should be considered normal. They should not be considered uh, something abnormal, something to be criminalized, or something that's considered suspect. So those are really the kind of three very simple core principles of the alliance that we're all kind of gathering around. Um, and then you know in more concrete terms, you know what we're doing is you know the things that I listed before. So this the, the legal fund to to band together around research. Um, you know, uh, shared events like a privacy, su privacy summit and then shifting the narrative really towards a, a focus more on what privacy enables for ordinary people rather than, you know, this kind of reactive, protective, suspect kind of, uh, kind of uh, attitude around privacy. So um, it's really trying to shift the dialogue from something that, that looks at, you know, and for me that last point is actually super fascinating because I think it's something that we don't think about enough. Um, even those of us that are for privacy, we tend to think about protection when we, when we think about privacy, right? It's protection and security. But actually, I think if we start looking at privacy as an intervention into the data economy, you start to see how it unlocks a whole other way of innovation actually taking place, right? So if now we're in a situation where you know, data is just grabbed left, right, and center, extracted kind of willy-nilly, and used for various things that people have no control over, 
the moment you have privacy as a default, people can start making proactive decisions about when they want data produced about them and what it's used for, which creates an entirely different dynamic around uh, you know, digital innovation and the innovation pathway that we start to, to tread as, as uh, human beings. And that, I think, is the most fascinating, fascinating bit here that I think is actually the, what's quite unprecedented, um, really, is that, that intervention that we have the, the chance to really do right now. Maybe a, a question for Marta. Um, what, what, what do you think are sort of the, the opportunities um, on a regulatory and, and legislative side where we can make an impact on, on privacy? And, and maybe also sort of um, thinking about our opportunities there versus just building tech, because um, we're doing both. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think one of the things that's really interesting about this particular moment in time is that um, one of the things we've seen in the, um, in the traditional financial system is that we've sort of just come to accept it as totally normal and fine that all of our financial transactions that we make with banks or other traditional financial institutions actually get turned over to the government by default without a warrant, no probable cause, completely innocent people, right, who have done nothing wrong, have their financial transactions turned over to the government in what is really just a mass surveillance program. Um, and we just accept that as normal because we think, well, it's financial payments. Somehow that's different from communications or other types of data that we, I think, maybe think a little bit more about requiring privacy. Um, and what's happening right now at this moment in time is we are seeing governments increasingly taking the mass surveillance of the traditional banking system and starting to apply it to cryptocurrency. And fundamentally, this is a technology that the, the deep ethos of this space is the whole point of this technology, right, is to not have our transactions turned over to the government um, as part of mass surveillance programs. That's the whole purpose of this technology. That's the whole ethos of this space. And so what's really interesting is that the battles that we're having right now about cryptocurrency and about extending the, the traditional, um, the surveillance of the traditional banking system to cryptocurrency is actually a moment where we're not only reflecting on uh, what is going to happen to cryptocurrency, but also why is it okay in general that we treat our financial transactions in a way where they can be turned over to the government by default without a warrant. Um, and one of the big problems in this space and problems with one of the things that's really difficult is that you know it, a lot of there are a lot of people even in the cryptocurrency space who will say things like, well, as long as we're treating cryptocurrency the same way we treat other financial transactions, that's fine. But it's not fine. Um, and so we're really starting to, um, I think things are really starting to come to a head. You're really seeing that one example is Tornado Cash, right? Uh, one big example is what's happened with Tornado Cash. Um, and I think that this is an opportunity, this moment in time, to not only fight the surveillance that we will see attempted to be applied to cryptocurrency, but also to think through as a society why it is that we think it's okay that financial transactions are surveilled. Excellent. I mean, one, one thing that you brought up at the end with Tornado Cash, um, you know, leads to a huge amount of um, anger and, and reaction. Um, but it also means that the regulatory bodies are framing that conversation. Um, are there ways we should be framing or, or uh, structuring the conversation where we can be more effective? I, j I just... Um... That's the thing, right? Is that policymakers and regulators, all of what we're building is still new. And it's hard to understand if you come from a different world. And what they see is tornado cash. And what they see is, um, like going back to consumer protection, for example, Celsius going bankrupt and people losing money. The crash of Terra Luna, NFT scams, right? Like pe this is the headlines. So again, like our job there is to educate them about what we're building, how it works, and get their attention out of the headlines into the actual meat of what we're building and why it's important for a flourishing digital society. 
Yeah, I think those are all good points. And I think it's also the language that we use. I think that the press release when they came down on Tornado Cast said notorious. What was the headline? Do you remember? It was like, it was, it was framed as these like notorious criminals that were like, it didn't say anything about like, you know, that this was like about the ethos of the project and that it was built by volunteers and that this was done. And like, you know, that this was a community driven event. So they were controlling the narrative. And then it's all of a sudden comes back to the industry to say like, you know, the only time privacy makes the news is when there is a crisis or the government needs to get involved because there's been some sort of scam. And we're not talking about all the things that we're doing and we're not talking about all of the things that we're educating. And I think that's one thing we need to do better as an industry is talk about the, the wins and talk about the, the consensus driven or governance that we have. Because a lot of the times when you're using these protocols, it's way stricter than the financial protocols that we see for banking. And we're doing a lot of the heavy lifting and we're creating that technology and we're all builders here. And now we have to come together to protect the people who are building the technology because we don't essentially understand what's going to happen from a governance perspective. So I think that's what makes it kind of really critical as a time for us to start doing something and doing it in a united way. Um, yeah, just to pick up on those uh, all very good points, I think the key thing here is exactly that, you know, what the Universal Privacy Alliance tries to do is to bring together um, technologists that are building privacy pre preserving uh, technologies exactly um, to give a voice to that perspective because there is so much misunderstanding of what can actually be done in this space. Um, and here I'm also thinking about like the, the new big debates at some point, you know, regulators are also gonna have to be educated on zero knowledge proofs, for example. <laughs> um, and I think like that's actually not like a, that's not a small uh, task. Um, also because like it, it, you know, it's a, for me it's a super interesting space because there's a lot of like fine grained architecting that we're gonna start to see happening in that space because what it does, you know, what, what ZK do is they open up a kind of gray zone of, you know, the, the difference between privacy and surveillance or, or private, the relationship between privacy and transparency becomes this new kind of thing. And it's a whole design space. And it's a design space that I think like is some is an area that I, that we don't have a full sense of yet in terms of um, what's at stake when it comes to privacy and social controls as well. Um, so I'm looking forward to the UPA also taking that by the horns and starting to have the internal conversations that need to be had around the the ethics, the social implications of the technologies that we're building, the legal implications of the technologies that we're building across jurisdictions, across regulatory frameworks. Um, and you know, to have that kind of internal coordination in order to exactly develop the right kind of narratives around the technologies, because the technologies challenge, are really challenge the core of uh, you know, what we understand as, as surveillance and privacy historically. Yeah, right now we have our trusted setup going on, which uses zero knowledge proofs. And it's been really interesting because the cryptography is really interesting. I think it's only been done six times before in the past. And um, we weren't sure how much interest there was going to be. So we put it out to the community. And we now have over 5,000 people in 130 different countries, like Brunei and the Seashells. And we asked them, like, why is privacy important to you? And for me, going through all of those comments about like, you know, maybe we come from a little bit of a privileged perspective because we are in places where privacy is more, and I don't ever think privacy is a luxury, but privacy is more optionality and consent, whereas people are living in places where privacy is critical to life. So it's like, you know, we're having this conversation, but we're building those technologies and that's all open source. So moving forward that anyone can build using that. And I think that just is something that needs to drive this forward because privacy is something that we don't necessarily have to say, we're gonna build this thing. People can build it based on their use cases. Maybe one question on that, that comes out of that um, is, is thinking about this multi-jurisdictional world that we've ended up in? Um, and how, how are we able to be effective and balance having a global message that's, a, that's uh, you know, you, you, you can frame narratives, but then getting down into each individual jurisdiction and understanding you, a regulatory landscape makes that enormously more effort uh, to make progress on. Um, so, so how do you balance that? Um, it is an enormous effort, and that's exactly why you need a universal privacy alliance, right? Um, that's the easy answer. <laughs> um, but uh, I also think that it's a very 
it's a kind of, I think it's time for the Web3 space to take this very realist perspective on regulatory frameworks and really understand what's happening here. Because I feel like many times the debate kind of oscillates between this like weird kind of like, oh, we exist outside of regulation because we're building decentralized tech and you know, but then actually like in the day-to-day -day operations, companies are registered in within specific jurisdictions and they absolutely have to comply and that's what we see over and over again. And somehow that kind of like space in between never gets bridged and like an honest, real conversation about how these regulatory frameworks across the world overlap with one another, um, how they uh, you know, impact on our ability to build privacy-preserving technologies, what that actually means, um, how we engage with regulators in a, in a, in a real way, which regulators to, to um, engage with, um, and how that all kind of operates in a real sense rather than just this kind of like, ah, you know, you know, you know we're, we're decentralized, it doesn't matter, and then like, oh, it totally does matter, and then like somehow, you know, we never get real about it and we never get like, I don't think we get sufficiently strategic about it either exactly for those reasons. And I think we could be far more powerful if we were much more strategic. And that's what I'm hoping we can do with the UPA. One thing I wanna add on that point, um, one of the things that I've seen that has been um, pretty unfortunate in the space is that there's this distinction that's drawn between privacy for financial transactions um, and privacy in general, um, and that somehow those are different things and that anonymous or private financial transactions are something that uh, are bad or literally illegal in the case of OFAC. And so fundamentally, um, one of the things that I think we need to really have as one of our messages and in building this privacy alliance, right, is that it's not just actually about financial transactions, all of the arguments that are being made against Tornado Cash and putting an entire protocol that enables anonymity on a OFAC sanctions list merely because it enables anonymous transactions, those are the same arguments that have been used against encryption, that have been used against Tor over and over and over again. And I think it's really important that you know we have up here, not just people from the uh, financial transaction space, but also that we're able to engage with and, and really um, partner with people who are also fighting for civil liberties uh, and uh, encryption and anonymity and civil liberties more generally. Fantastic. We've got a few more minutes. Maybe we can have everyone um, go around and, and give us something to take away. Like if, you know, what, what is the important thing that you'd like us to, to leave this panel with? Okay. Um, what do I want to leave the panel with? I'll just say that even like th things like this, the Universal Privacy Alliance are important for a lot of reasons that we've talked about. And it's important to bring together, I think, you know, we have these like kind of two approaches to what's happening here. There's like the anarchist throw up the middle finger, like, F the man, kind of like, we're gonna build it anyway. There's the people who are careful about, uh, the, the people, on, people on teams that are careful about going through channels and trying to work with regulators and policymakers and things like that. And it just, it's gonna take all types, right? If something happens where we get slapped or privacy in crypto gets uh, is made illegal, or, it's made, or something is banned, right? The people on this panel and many of the people in this room will be able to figure out how to work around stuff. And the people who really need it, like uh, one of our friends who is teaching girls to code in Afghanistan and is being shut down by the Taliban um, with threat of awful things that I don't want to even think about. She m might be able to figure it out, maybe, but it's hard. But imagine the economic freedom that we give up if we don't come together and work together. Um, for those people like my brother, who lives in Indiana, right, who's not very technical, doesn't really, I mean, we're fighting for people who don't know that we're fighting for them. 
Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I think the people in this room and we're having these conversations and we're building and we're creating the technology and we're trying to create the infrastructure and we're trying to create the governance and we're trying to create the legal framework. But like my ask would be to have a conversation with anyone in your life about privacy and start elevating that conversation because the conversations I have with, you know, I'd say like my family is I'm not doing anything wrong. I've got nothing to hide. And for some reason, people think privacy and they think government. They don't think that opt-in privacy or opt-out privacy is, is something that's critical, but it's a paradigm that has been moving very quickly. And I say I just encourage everyone to have a conversation about privacy and trying to elevate privacy within their own lives, but also within their immediate circle, because we're building these things. And we, I'm, I mean, I believe in the technology and I believe in, in, in philosophy, but we also need adoption. So, you know, we're launching these products. We want you to go in. We want you to test them. We want you to give us your feedback. Um, we want to represent the people that need representation. So, um, yeah, just have those conversations with the people that you care about, not just your dev friends. What to end off with. Um, privacy loves company. It requires, you know, everyone to get involved. Um, that's super important. The more people that are involved, the better we can protect things. Uh, privacy is normal, um, and it should be normal in the digital world as well, which it's not right now, so let's make it normal in the digital world. Uh, privacy technologists have a huge burden of responsibility right now, and it's time to, to step up and um, make that a reality. Um, I will just end here with, um, you know, I think for a lot of people, it has been very hard to think about specifically why financial surveillance matters so much um, in, in when we're in positions where um, you know our our day-to-day -day lives are not actually threatened and you know you mentioned the protesters in Hong Kong who are waiting in long lines and subway stations right um, so that they can use cash uh, instead of having their electronic purchases place them at the scene of the protest and those are really the people for whom financial privacy really matters but I do think that we're entering an era unfortunately um, just as one example with the overturning of Roe v. Wade, where suddenly it is more real to people why people in their day-to-day -day lives might actually need financial privacy um, in order to actually maintain their own civil liberties. Um, so I think it's really a, a moment in time where a lot of these uh, important uh, considerations are coming to bear. All right. One last comment. One last comment, which is that the UPA website is privacyalliance.com. So look that up and um, get in touch if you want to join the Alliance or even if you just want to hear more um, about what it's about and how to get involved, uh, the principles and, and everything else, the membership process and everything is, is information and it will start being uploaded onto the website soon. So please do get in touch. <laughs>